It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Premier. My question is uh, sorry. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, survivors of sexual violence traveled from all across this province to hear this House discuss the crisis in our justice system yesterday, and their government betrayed them. They didn't just kill the debate on an important bill. They wouldn't even allow a discussion about the thousands of sexual assault cases that are being dismissed right now in our broken court system. Will the Premier stand in his place and explain to survivors of sexual assault why they are not only losing their day in court, but also losing their day in this legislature as well. Members, please take their seats. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Look, as I had uh, said uh, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry that the Leader of the Opposition uh, uh, and uh, her party are characterizing it that way. What we did yesterday was uh, in recognition of the, the really the important step that this uh, parliament took as a whole with respect to the motion on intimate partner violence and the uh, standing up of the Justice Committee led by a former Crown Prosecutor, the member for kitchener Huspler, to investigate uh, how we can ensure that uh, victims and survivors of intimate partner violence are, uh, are better treated, uh, not only in the justice system, by those who provide services for, uh, for victims uh, and survivors, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it seemed reasonable to me that we expedite passage of uh, that bill into the committee so that it could also form part of the work that is being done by the Standing Committee on Justice. Uh, Response. Uh, uh, the very, very important work, uh, Mr. Speaker, that is being done by that committee uh, when it reports back, so that it can report back to this parliament very as a whole good. and we can consider the options. A supplementary question. First of all, Speaker, I want to be very clear uh, for the government here. Uh, these are two separate issues, actually. Intimate partner violence, sexual assault. We are asking, actually, about accountability, and we are asking about clearing the backlog for sexual assault cases. Our courts are so overwhelmed that in one year alone, over 1,300 survivors had their cases dismissed, thrown out. There is no justice in that, and you don't need to study it. It is a fact. But once again, Speaker, the government is playing procedural games on a very important issue. So I want to ask the Premier, you are in government, you have the power, how about you be decisive for once and do the right thing? Members will take their seats. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Government House Leader may respond. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I, I would submit to the Leader of the Opposition that is exactly what this Parliament was the other day. It was very decisive in, uh, in ensuring that this uh, particular bill, which I have uh, said both inside the House and outside the House, has many elements which I think are, are very, uh, uh, very important. Uh, uh, the, the, the Leader of the Opposition is quite correct. Uh, intimate partner violence and the, the, what we're challenged with in that bill are two separate things, but often handled in very much the same way in our, not only in our court system, but by those who provide services for victims uh, and, uh, and survivors and their family, Mr. Speaker. We've heard from countless numbers uh, uh, of individuals that uh, uh, often uh, services are fragmented. We look at what the work that was done by the, uh, the member from... Uh, uh, Halliburton and Response the committee with respect order. To, uh, to human trafficking, Mr. Speaker. We lead the world in how we handle and uh, tackle human trafficking issues. I think this parliament can do the same when it comes to these issues, and we're ready to do that work. The final supplementary, the member for Waterloo. Thank you. And my question is back to the Premier. It is unacceptable that they will stand here and say to the women who worked on Lydia's Law, the women who traveled to Queen's Park yesterday, to Lydia herself, that it wasn't their turn to speak. The government says they need to know more before they can address the crisis in the courts. Well, yesterday, you had a chance to learn, but they refused to listen. Survivors of sexual violence are being told to wait until the government gives them permission to come to committee. They feel betrayed. Lydia feels betrayed. Premier, how can the intimate partner violence study succeed 
when you have lost the trust of this community in this province of Ontario. I to ask members to make their comments through the chair. Government House Leader to respond. Mr. Speaker, listen, I, I guess I just have uh, more confidence in parliamentarians to do the important work that is required to ensure that we move forward for victims, survivors, and their families, Mr. Speaker. We have a lot of things that we do do in this province very, very well, but what we have heard from victims, from their families, from survivors, is that often those services don't work well together. And how can we make that change happen better? Now, I, I take it at full faith that the members opposite are going to work cooperatively with members from all sides of this House to move forward and do something very, very important work, similar to the work that we did, the member led by the member for Halliburton with respect to human trafficking. We want the same thing, Mr. Speaker, and to suggest that Spons. anybody to suggest that anybody is not hearing is just absolutely wrong. Let's take the opportunity Order. to do something very special to work across party lines and get this right, Mr. Speaker. Order. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. That was a disappointing response, but uh, I'm going I'm to move on here for now. Uh, the next question is for the Premier again. Uh, 10,000 patients are going to lose their primary care in Sault Ste. Marie by the end of this month, in just a couple of weeks, including retired steel workers. And you know why that matters? It's because those retirees, they founded the Group Health Centre. And they took a pay cut. You know, they took their hard-earned dollars to build themselves a world-class, a world-renowned clinic in their hometown. And in exchange, they were promised health care at that clinic for the rest of their lives. But now that's being taken away, and this government has no plan to help them. So I'm going to ask the Premier, uh, is he going to make sure Question. that his health minister finally acts here, or is the loss of primary care in the Sioux not a major concern either? Members, please take your seats. Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, and Parliamentary Assistant Minister of Health. We do have a plan. Since 2018, we've registered 12,500 new physicians in Ontario, including an almost 10 percent increase in family doctors. But we do know there's more to be done, Speaker. Our plan is reversing the old Liberal policies that were really short-sighted. They were supported by the NDP, Speaker, that eliminated 50 medical residency school positions. That is hundreds of less doctors practicing today in Ontario. On top of that, you know, we can go back to the, the Ray days and you know, the Leader of the Opposition. You were a staffer there, and I know you don't like the Order. facts, but you were a staffer, part of the Ray Order. days, and you de Order. Order. Opposition come to order. Member for Stormont, Dundas, Queen Gary, please conclude your answer. Thank you, Speaker. We're working closely with MPP Romano on our expansion of primary care. As part of Ontario's largest Spots. expansion of primary care, we've invested $1.1 million into two new teams in Sault Ste. Marie, Speaker. Again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The supplementary question. Better than Wikipedia here, Speaker. Uh, take the notes away. Try to answer the question. You know perfectly well that this is not addressing Order. the current issue. Access to the government side will come to order. The member for Stormont Dundas South Glengarry will come to order. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga will come to order. The member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas will come to order. The government side will come to order. I need an O2 to keep track of who's got the floor. <laughs> Hope no one objects to that. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. 
hit a nerve there, eh, Speaker? But look, I mean, they, 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 like, I just want them to answer the question. I want them to answer the question because they know perfectly well Order. that they're not Order. addressing the current issue. Access to primary care shouldn't depend on where you live. Uh, if these patients in Sault Ste. Marie lose access to their primary care doctor, you know where they're going to end up? They're going to end up in emergency rooms that are already overcrowded. And there's only one emergency room in the Sioux, right? The next closest one is Sudbury. That's four hours away, Speaker. So what is this government's plan to address the urgent crisis in primary Question. care in Sault Ste. Marie before the end of the month? Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. As I clearly stated, Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition I don't think likes to listen to the facts, but we've invested $1.1 million into two new two. primary care two. teams in Sault Ste. Marie. <laughs> Speaker, I'll state it again, but Ontario is leading the country with almost 90 per cent of Ontarians having a family doctor or a primary care health provider. Speaker, We are continuing to reverse the horrible Liberal policies that were propped up by many of the members of the NDP over there. Speaker. Since 2018, as I've stated clearly, we've registered 12,500 new doctors in Ontario, Speaker, and we'll continue doing what is needed to be done to ensure that we have the best publicly funded health care system across Order. Canada. Speaker. Order. The final supplementary, back to the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the fact is this, this clinic is closing its doors to 10,000 people by the end of this month. 10,000 more people in the Sioux without health care. And this government has no plan. 2.4 million Ontarians in Ontario who, who have no primary care right now, but for this government, for their health minister, that's not a major concern. That's right. 350 physicians short in Northern Ontario, including more than 200 family doctors. Many, many more, half of the physicians working in Northern Ontario are expected to retire in the next five years, and this government has no plan. So I want to ask the Premier to stand Order. in his place for once, stop making excuses, do something decisive, Question. and treat this issue like the crisis that it surely, surely is. Members, please take their seat. Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. I noticed the leader stumbled on her notes there, but we won't actually take credit for that. <laughs> Speaker, last year we registered 2,400 new doctors that practice in our province. Speaker, we're also opening a new medical school at York University. Speaker, that the opposition can vote for today. Speaker, last year was a record-breaking year for a year for nurses in Ontario. We registered over 17,500 nurses. Order. We've also increased the amount of nursing seats by 3,000 nurses and seats in Ontario's College and University, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, we're funding the largest expansion of medical school spots in over 15 years, adding 1,212 undergraduate and 1,637 postgraduate seats across Ontario. Speaker, 60 per cent of these spots will be dedicated to family medicine. Again, I recommend the Leader of the Opposition vote for our budget today, Speaker. Order. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2016, Solomon Fakiri suffered from schizoaffective disorder. He was temporarily housed in a correctional facility. He was denied mental health resources. Pleas from his families were ignored, and even though he was clearly in crisis. Solomon Fakiri died in jail 11 days later. He was restrained with his hands behind his back. He was restrained on his ankles. He was restrained in many other places. Pepper sprayed, and his face was covered with a spit hood. His death was deemed a homicide by Ontario's coroners in an inquest that put forward 57 recommendations directly to this government. The first recommendation called on the government to recognize that correctional facilities were not an appropriate place for people experiencing mental health. The government has been expected to respond in, within 60 days. It's now been six months. Yesterday, because of government inaction, I tabled the Justice for Solly Act. Question. I and the Fakiri family, who are here today, calling on this government to support the act, and they want to know how many more people have to die 
in jails because they are living with a mental health crisis before they act. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any death is too many, and we are absolutely committed to making sure that Ontario's correctional system is safe for everyone. Mr. Speaker, years ago, under the previous government's watch, they brought our correctional system and our public safety system to its knees. And that's why this government under Premier Ford has made a tremendous investment to make sure that our correctional systems are safe. We've invested over a half a billion dollars on infrastructure improvement. We've hired over a thousand new correctional officers. We have native, we have native inmate liaison officers, nylos, and chaplains there. Mr. Speaker, we have done a lot in a short period of time, and we will continue to do so each and every day. Supplementary question. Speaker, back to the premier. Solomon Fakiri's family knew something was wrong the minute he went to jail. They tried to visit him four separate times during his 11 days. They were barred from seeing him. The family and correctional staff knew Solomon Fakiri urgently needed mental health support and service, but nothing was done. According to the coroner's report, Speaker, at the time of death, Solomon Fakiri had over 50 bruises on his body, despite the fact that he was in segregation during his entire time in jail. There are over 60 policy breaches leading up to Solomon's homicide while he was in government custody. The family here is asking for an apology, recognition of their pain and suffering. Yes or no, Premier? Will you give the Fakiri family the apology they deserve for Solomon's tragic and preventable death? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our thoughts are with the family and the friends of Solomon Fakiri. This was a terrible tragedy beyond measure. And Mr. Speaker, that's exactly why, in the last year since Premier Ford has been our Premier, we have taken public safety very seriously. And that includes the investments in our correctional facilities, the half a billion dollar infrastructure improvements, the suicide prevention and intervention training to make sure that our correctional officers understand things that they may not have understood 20 years ago. It's important that everyone knows, Mr. Speaker, we will make the investments required to keep our Ontario safe. Thank you. The next question. The member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Speaker, last year's Feed Ontario report saw a 38% increase in the food basic usage in Ontario, with over 800,000 Ontarians having to access a food bank. This is the single largest increase ever recorded, Speaker. Sadly, Ontarians are being forced to visit food banks because of the regressive and harmful carbon tax is driving up the cost of food. Order. The opposition colleagues don't want to talk about this. They want to ignore facts. We, we heard this morning from the PA to Health Speaker. Speaker. Member will take a seat. The House will come to order. The member for Perth Wellington has the floor. It's allowed to ask a question. <laughs> member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. The independent Liberals members in this place and the federal Liberal government need to understand that if you tax our farm families who grow the food and the truckers who ship the food, you end up taxing the Ontario families who buy the food, Speaker. This regressive tax is a disgrace and it must be scrapped. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the Liberal carbon tax is making life harder and more expensive for hard-working Ontarians? Minister of Energy. 
Thanks, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Perth Wellington for a very important question. I can't believe the response from the opposition parties in the legislature today when everybody in our province and across the country knows that the carbon tax is driving up the cost of living. It's been confirmed by the Bank of Canada and C.D. Howe and so many different institutes, Mr. Speaker, and it is having an effect on people's ability to afford groceries and gas and home heating. And this federal carbon tax, supported by the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, is going to, well, it's the impact today, it's the impact today, it's going to be the legacy of the federal government, and ultimately, it's going to be the downfall of the federal government, because not only is it causing a crisis now in communities across our province and our country, Spons. it's going to create an even further impact next year on April 1st when the carbon tax goes up again. We have a plan here in Ontario. It's working, and it doesn't include a carbon tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. As a young member in this place, I know the carbon tax has done nothing for the environment. It instead has driven up the cost of basic necessities and made it difficult for food banks and other nonprofits to serve our most vulnerable citizens. Speaker, food banks across the province are now paying more for gas and diesel to transport the food, more for natural gas to heat their buildings, and more for the food on their shelves. 69% of food banks are concerned that they don't have enough food to meet the demand, and the carbon tax is forcing them Order. to stretch their already limited budgets even further. And what's worse is that this tax burden is only going to rise every single year. Speaker, Speaker can the minister please explain Question. what our government is doing to protect our food banks and other nonprofits from this disastrous carbon tax? Minister of Energy. Speaker, uh, thanks again for the supplementary. I would advise the opposition members to talk to the not for profits, to talk to the food banks in their region, like I do. I talk to the Gleaners Food Bank, Order. I talk to the Trenton Care Hamilton food Mountain Bank Come riding, and they are definitely hearing from their clients that the carbon tax is having an impact on their day to day life, Mr. Speaker. That's why we've taken a different approach here in Ontario than Justin Trudeau and the federal government. We're lowering taxes. We've cut the gas tax by 10.7 cents a litre, Mr. Speaker. We've implemented the lift credit. It eliminates the provincial income tax for many low-income workers, and it's making a difference for them, Mr. Speaker. We've eliminated fees. We've eliminated the license plate sticker fees. We brought in one fare for those who ride transit, saving them up to $1,600 a year. That's real, tangible savings for the people of Ontario. And here in Ontario, with our plan that doesn't include a carbon tax, we are seeing growth in our economy, Lots. more good-paying jobs being created, like the ones that will soon be created at Honda and Volkswagen and Stellantis and those multi-billion dollar investments. Thank you very much. The member, next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. As Ontario drags its feet to create new $10-a-day childcare spaces, this government has forced many affordable spaces we do have to leave the program, and this means doubling the costs that parents pay. Ontario child care centres have been urgently calling for a funding formula that actually works. Back in September of 2023, this government said it was working on a new formula that would be in place at the end of 2024. Now they're telling child care operators to wait another year. Minister. What excuse do you have to give families who have to pay the price for your funding formula delay? Dan, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The Minister of Education can respond. The parents are saving six to twelve thousand dollars because of our government's policy on child care. So the price they pay is longer wait lists if we adhere to the advice of the NDPs and Liberals who want us to literally make the wait list longer by precluding one-third of the sector from being involved in the federal deal. That is your position. That is your stated recommendation to government, to preclude 70,000 spaces. You you're asking me a question about access when you have urged this government to sign the first deal that would have denied every parent in a for-profit childcare. These are operated by women, small businesses, who simply want access to affordable care, too. Why does the NDP oppose affordable childcare for every parent in this province? 
supplementary question. Speaker, there are two things that you need in child care baby formula and a funding formula. And taking two years for a funding formula is, uh, is unacceptable. Ola, a child care provider, pulled out of the program, citing a broken funding model. The YMCA, the largest operator in the province, has been warning for months about the risk of closure if the funding formula isn't updated soon to actually cover the cost for providing child care. Families are worried about whether there will be affordable child care available when they need it. Why is the minister putting more child care spaces at risk with these delays? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the formula will be unveiled this year. It will be operational for January of 2025, as we have said all along. What we've also committed to is continuing to reduce child care fees. Currently, when we, rather, when we came to power in 2018, child care on average was $46 to $50 a day. It is $23 a day on track to go down even further over the next year and a half, delivered by our Premier and our Progressive Conservative team. We are increasing the spaces in every region of Ontario. 86,000 additional spaces are on track, 19,000 in Toronto alone. We are committed to affordability, to standing up against higher taxes on working parents. From the carbon tax to higher fees, we stand for affordability in this province. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you very much, Speaker. Good morning. Uh, thank, I'd like to uh, ask a question to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. The Liberal carbon tax is punishing Ontario businesses and making life more unaffordable for families and businesses throughout the province. It is driving up the price of everyday essentials, such as food, heating and gas, making life more expensive for workers to transport equipment. Speaker, we know that workers in Ontario deserve better. The federal government needs to stop listening to elites, extremists and activists and start listening to the families and businesses that make up our province who have had enough of this tax hike. It's time to scrap this job-killing tax today. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House the steps our government is taking to ensure we have trained force, workforce ready to build Ontario's future and fight this Liberal carbon tax? And to reply, the parliamentary assistant and, minister, and member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. I just got my notes out so I can answer this question. As the member is aware, years of Liberal mismanagement and neglect has left this province with huge labour shortages and thousands of good jobs are going left vacant. Sadly, to make matters worse, as millions of workers struggle with today's higher cost of linen, the Bonnie Crombie Liberals and the carbon tax queen wants to make their life even more afford unaffordable. Her support for the carbon tax translates into higher prices, not just at the gas pumps, but across all aspects of life. It effectively becomes a tax on everything, as it causes transportation costs to soar and grocery bills to rise. By increasing the financial burden on essentials, the carbon tax under, the Crummy, under Bonnie's watch threatens to diminish the quality of life for all Ontarians, making it Response. harder for them to thrive in an already uncertain economic climate. That's why, Speaker, our government has established over a billion dollars for the Skill Development Fund, which has already assisted over half a million individuals in advancing their careers and securing higher pay. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Parliamentary Assistant for that answer. And I think you're, you're absolutely correct. The people of Ontario spoke a few weeks ago in both Milton and Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, and they, they told us what they think of this Liberal carbon tax. This impacts every, every single person every time they go fill up their tanks at the gas pump, but it drives up the cost of operations and transportation for business owners. But, Speaker, let's be clear. Bonnie Crombie's Liberals don't care about what impacts this disastrous tax is having on Ontario workers and families. They are happy to see their federal cousins nearly triple this tax by 2030. Our government will always stand up for the workers here in Ontario. It's time the federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts stand up and do the same with us. Speaker, can the minister tell the House how our government is improving the lives of workers in spite of this Liberals' anti-worker agenda? The member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you once again to the member. Again, it was bad enough when the Liberals simply neglected our trade workers. Now, under the Crombie's leadership, it's even more dire as they support their federal counterparts in taxing not just the livelihoods, 
but also the ability of these workers to support themselves and their families with their oppressive anti-worker carbon tax. However, our government will never go against the workers of this province. To support jobs in the skilled trades and all workers and job seekers across Ontario, our government is making groundbreaking investments in communities across the province to ensure workers and job seekers can upgrade their skills and get jobs closer to home. Our government message is clear. Skilled trades are open to everyone. Our government is proud of the steps we have taken so far and we have seen the results. We have seen the percentage of new registrants Response. to the skilled trades who are women up by a historic 28 per cent. We have launched the FAST program to get our youth into the trades. Our government will always work for workers and job seekers to ensure Ontario's economy works for everyone. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul. In my community of St. Paul's, the question is to the Premier. Uh, we are fortunate to have John Howard Society Community Office working tirelessly to support people affected by the justice system and those trying to rebuild productive lives post-incarceration. JHS has been on the front lines advocating for just and a reformed bail system. They've offered substantive recommendations to this government standing committee on justice policy. One of those key recommendations was for the government to invest in bail supervision programs that have a, pro a proven history and provide a lower cost alternative to pretrial detention, a practice that is disproportionately applied more to black, indigenous and racialized individuals than white individual speaker for the same and similar charges. My question is to the Premier. Can the Premier share what investments they have made in the current budget to address the need for more bail supervision programs? Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. It's a very important area because we do want people who are, are uh, finished serving their, their sentence or uh, on the back end of, of uh, that situation to have the supports that they need to be successful in our communities, Mr. Speaker. We're in constant communication with whether it be John Howard Society uh, or others who are providing service and bail supervision. Uh, we, we're making constant investments. We've increased capacity in terms of funding for victim services. Uh, we've increased funding for, for those, those areas of need, Mr. Speaker, and I'll get into some more specifics in the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. It costs approximately $300 a day to house, well, warehouse an individual in pretrial detention. Again, a practice that disproportionately targets black, indigenous, and racialized populations, as well as people experiencing homelessness, mental health, and addictions. That is millions of dollars spent yearly to incarcerate people who are legally innocent and awaiting trial. It is cheaper to invest in evidence-based community programs and services that address the root causes of violence. John Howard Society is recommending deep government investments in programs focused on prevention, intervention and reintegration, as well as robust in investments in supportive housing people. Since the overall dismantling of the social safety net by this government has led to an increase in incarceration. My question, question. again is back to the Premier. Hopefully he'll answer. Why is spending $300 a day to warehouse legally innocent people, why is that the status quo, as opposed to lower cost-effective community-based interventions like supportive housing? Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now understand why the member opposite voted against providing bail beds for those who are in need, Mr. Speaker, of housing and temporary shelter. Mr. Speaker, it's, we are providing the support, and we are going to hold people to account. But at the same time, we are doing things differently, Mr. Speaker. We have provided, we've started justice centres, which are one of a kind, Mr. Speaker, in, in Ontario. We got the idea from Red Hook, New Jersey, Mr. Order. Speaker. They are meeting people where they are at helping them with some of their underlying issues while we provide appropriate responses from the justice system, Mr. Speaker. We will not apologize for investing in all areas of this and at the same time holding people to account. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. Last year, to help Ontarians through the winter, Ontario Liberals proposed removing the HST from home heating. This Conservative government said no. This spring, Ontario Liberals have proposed a $1,000 tax credit for parents who put their kids in extracurricular activities and sports. And just this week, Ontario Liberals have proposed a massive tax cut for small businesses that will save them up to $18,000 a year. 
What have we seen from this government? The conservative gravy train getting longer and longer. Bigger budgets for the Premier's office. A sunshine list of six-figure salaries that eclipses all others in history. Sole source contracts and special access to Greenbelt lands for their friends, donors, and insiders. While Ontario Liberals propose concrete measures to help families with the affordability crisis, this Conservative government is focused on adding passengers to the gravy train. When will this government vote for common sense Liberal tax cuts and start putting Ontario families first over their friends, their donors, and their insiders? And to apply, the Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, to our great member from Orleans, I appreciate his question, but you know, I just have to remind him his party was the one who bankrupt this province. His party was the one who chased 300,000 jobs out of the province, that destroyed our health care system, that when we walked into the office, Mr. Speaker, almost six years ago, every single ministry was a disaster. Move forward to today. There's over 700,000 more Order. people working today paying taxes. We're the only government in the history of this country that's never raised a tax. We've actually reduced taxes. We reduced the gas tax by 10.7 cents. We got rid of the, the tolls on the 412, 418. We got rid of the car uh, registration uh, stickers, saving millions and millions of dollars uh, for the people of Ontario. We have never, think of that, raised revenues by 64 Order. billion, never raised a tax, cut and reduced the burden off companies Response. by 8.5 billion dollars each and every year, and we're seeing billions, tens of billions of dollars of investment in our province. Supplementary question. Well, Mr. Speaker, we've heard it all before. When campaigning for office, the Premier promised a 20% tax cut for the middle class. Six years later, nothing. The Premier campaigned on reining in spending and cutting the deficit. Six years later, his government's breaking all records for spending, and the province's debt has increased by $90 billion. The Premier famously promised buck a beer, and while Ontarians prepare for the May 2-4 weekend, they know that a 2-4 in Ontario has never been more expensive, Mr. Speaker. While the Premier has broken all of his promises to the middle class, he's done his best for his friends, his donors, and his insiders. The passengers on the Premier's gravy train are treated to first-class patronage, sole source government contracts, greenbelt giveaways, and special access, all leading to an RCMP investigation. Why does this government continue to put the interests of highly paid insiders, lobbyists, friends and donors over the interests Question. of Ontario families. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think the Premier said it so incredibly well, Mr. Speaker, but let's go back in time a little bit when they were in power for 15 years and they increased the debt by $200 billion. You know, it's kind of uh, incredible to think that uh, all those hospitals they built and all those highways they built and all those subways they built and all the... Oh, sorry, Mr. Order. Speaker, I'm being corrected by this side of the House that uh, I've got it wrong. I, I have to correct the record. They built nothing, Mr. Speaker. In fact, they saw the taillights of those cars, those manufacturing jobs, leave Ontario to go to the United States. You know what you're seeing now is those headlights, those headlights of the there people coming to Ontario. 7,000 headlights coming back to Ontario. Good paying jobs in St. Thomas, in Alliston, and now Port Colburn, Mr. Speaker, if something happened in Ontario, the member opposite should take note of that. The next question, order. The member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. At a time when Ontario families continue to struggle with rising costs of living and high interest rates, the federal Liberal went ahead with their 23% carbon tax hike last month. To make matter worse, the Liberals are doubling down and tripling the tax by 2030. It's unfair that the federal Liberals, supported by the carbon tax queen Bonnie Crombie, are hiking this regressive tax on the back of every Ontarian. Speaker, when this tax gets tripled, the increase in the cost of food, goods and services will triple for all of us. That's unacceptable. Our government condemns the carbon tax, and we are once again asking the federal Liberals to scrap this tax now. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to address the devastating impacts of the carbon tax? The Minister of Energy. 
Mr. Speaker, when uh, the Liberals were in power here in Ontario for 15 years, they tripled our electricity rates. Mr. Speaker, they drove jobs out of our province to other jurisdictions. The Minister of Finance just referenced the tail lights that were heading out of the province as manufacturers picked up and left. Well, those same Liberals, when they were annihilated here in Ontario, where did they go? They're all now working for Justin Trudeau up on Parliament Hill. And what's happened? We have this torturous carbon tax that's driving up the price of everything in our province again. Now, since we've come in, we've provided stability for electricity customers, and we're seeing the fruits of our labour, multi-billion dollar investments in our province. Those headlights are coming back to Ontario again and reinvesting here, while the voters in Ontario continue to put the vehicle in reverse and back over the Liberals because they are torturing businesses and Residents, constituents across our country, Mr. Speaker, Response. we're cutting taxes, we're lowering electricity rates, we're giving people a break in Ontario. Liberals, thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It, it is reassuring to hear that our government stands firmly behind the people of this province and continues to fight uh, the uh, costly carbon tax. While we have constantly introduced measures to make life more affordable, uh, more needs to be done to address Ontarians' ongoing affordability concerns. But, Speaker, last month at the Empire Club in Toronto, the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, called our gas tax cut a gimmick. What? She said that she would cancel it when she got a chance. Jeez. Speaker, many of our constituents are already struggling. Denying them financial relief is not only unfair but also cruel. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House why Bonnie Crombie's Liberal are out of touch with their support for the carbon tax? Minister of Energy. Oh, that was a bit of a newsflash. I, I hadn't heard that, but the Queen of the Carbon Tax isn't fooling anybody. Her Majesty is in full support of the federal Liberal government's federal carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, one that went up on 23 per cent on April the 1st and one that's going to go up again next year. It's driving up the cost of everything in our province. Now, we know that the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, when she comes in, is going to continue to make life more expensive. They're trying to rebrand over there. They're, they're trying to talk about some, some tax credits, but it's just not believable because we know the track record of Liberals at every level. The funny thing is, when it comes to the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, that across the country, Liberal premiers, NDP premiers, they're all with Premier Ford on this. We need to scrap this punitive carbon tax now because it's driving up the Response. price of everything. It's driving people to food banks, Mr. Speaker. It's driving people into ener energy poverty. We don't need it. It's time to scrap the tax. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, in Sudbury, multiple tenants have been uh, targeted by their landlord. He's trying to force them to move out of his apartment. Speaker, Marie is one of these tenants, and that's not her real name. She's afraid to use her real, her real name. Marie told me the entire building had no heat all winter. She said the landlord was literally trying to freeze them out. When that didn't work, the landlord sent Marie a text, and I'm going to read it verbatim. Hi, this is the owner. Can we talk tomorrow? I want to discuss incentivizing you to give me the apartment union back. Speaker, tenants like Marie have been living in this building for years without any issues. Then the building was purchased by an out-of-town landlord, and these tenants are being forced out of their own homes. My question, Speaker, we're in a housing crisis, and unscrupulous landlords are doing everything they can to kick people out of their homes so they can double the rent. Why isn't the Premier protecting people like Marie? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and I was listening very intently to, to the, the message, and, and what I heard was that a landlord is communicating with his tenants about uh, potential future uh, action and mr speaker there's 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 rules for that there's a tribunal for that mr speaker there there are ways that this can happen in in a in a balanced way mr Order. speaker it's an independent tribunal we have put so many resources into that tribunal that the member opposite has voted against. We have doubled the number of adjudicators. We had 30 per cent more cases last year, Mr. Speaker, but we cleared 40 per cent, 45 per cent more than, than the year before, Mr. Speaker. We are making great Order. progress in this area, and we are making the, the service available. And so I, I think the, the member's constituent has resources, uh, has avenues, rather, uh, to resolve this dispute if she doesn't want to talk to the, to the landlord himself. 
Supplementary, back to the member for Sudbury. Serious, would I be raising this here if the regular avenues weren't working? It's a failure for this entire government. The next tenant, I got to call him Ray Speaker because he can't use his name because he's so terrified about losing his home. Raise a tenant in the exact same building. Raise rent is supposed to include hydro, like all the tenants in there. But I guess shutting off the heat and bribing the tenants wasn't working, so the landlord stopped paying for hydro. The problem is Ray has medical equipment he needs to stay alive, and it needs hydro. So Ray has to decide, does he give up groceries or does he risk dying? That's the situation the Premier's put us in, Speaker. These stories aren't uncommon. They're happening all around the province, and pretending they have blinders on, Speaker, they are out to lunch. When will the Premier implement rent controls and other safeguards to protect tenants from bad landlords like this one? Members will please take their seats. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite clearly isn't aware that we have created more purpose-built rentals than anybody in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Municipal Affairs just does a phenomenal job on that. And as for disputes, Mr. Speaker, if landlords are doing things inappropriate, there is a tribunal for that, Mr. Speaker. There are rules, Mr. Speaker. Order. They have recourse, Mr. Speaker. This is how the system works. It's an independent tribunal. We have resourced it with additional Order. staff. We have doubled the number of adjudicators. Mr. We have St. fixed Catherine, the back Mr. end that the NDP supporting the Liberals left in shambles, Mr. Speaker. We had to build the thing from the ground up because they Order. left it so bad. Mr. Speaker, we are getting the job done, and we won't take any lessons from the NDP, Mr. Speaker. The next question. The member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Greenhouse growers are a significant contributor to the local economy in my riding of Chatham Kent Leamington and throughout Ontario, providing a wide range of great paying jobs and nutritious food. Just last week, many of us here had the opportunity to meet with members of the Ontario Greenhouse Alliance to talk about challenges facing the sector. I heard how Ontario's greenhouse farming families are being hurt financially as a result of the federal Liberals' unfair tax schemes. Speaker, it's clear we need immediate action to end the carbon tax. It's time the federal Liberals listen to what we've been saying for years and scrap the tax. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how the carbon tax is costing Ontario greenhouse growers? Excellent question. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much. Speaker, I want to rise in this House and acknowledge that, yes, the Ontario Greenhouse Alliance was here last week. And I hope the members opposite heard loud and clear how the carbon tax is punishing the people who produce good quality food close to home here in Ontario. The carbon tax is now 30 per cent of everyone's energy bills, whether you're a chicken farmer or a greenhouse operator. You know, any relief that greenhouse farmers actually had was completely wiped out on April 1st with the 23 per cent increase in carbon tax. And you know what the irony is in this? HST gets charged on top of the carbon tax. So we have a tax on a tax. Moreover, people need to understand farmers need carbon. They're part of the solution. In greenhouses, that carbon is needed to grow our food. And so why Response. do the federal Liberals continue to punish? Why does Bonnie Crombie stand with those federal liberal Liberals and enable them to continue to punish Ontario? The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for your work and for that response. It's shocking to hear how the Liberal carbon tax is negatively impacting Ontario's fresh flower, fruit and vegetable growers. Our food supply chain relies on these very fruits and vegetables grown year-round in Ontario's greenhouses. That's why all governments should be working to ensure the success of this vital sector. Speaker, the Liberal carbon tax is harming our farmers by adding unnecessary costs. The federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts and the opposition need to face reality and eliminate this unnecessary, costly tax. Speaker, can the minister please share with the House how the carbon tax is negatively impacting the prosperity and growth of Ontario's greenhouse and farming sectors? Mr. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. 
Thank you very much. You know, we're hearing from the greenhouse sector that they could increase production year over year, amounting to upwards of an additional 21,000 jobs over the next six years. But that won't be realized if they continue to be punished by the Liberal ideology that leads to this carbon tax. You know, it's unfortunate because right in the member from Chatham-Kent Leamington's area, there are four greenhouses that are looking to grow. But unfortunately, because of this Liberal ideology that is costing them to see an increase in the cost of production of food, they're going to look to expand south of the border. No. We're going to see taillights of farmers border. leaving Ontario because of this punishing carbon tax. People need to wake up and understand Ontario farmers can be part of the solution. Border. Scrap the tax. Border. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Representatives from the Niagara region visited Queen's Park this week with a simple request for collaboration. Help build an affordable housing project within St. Catharines at 320 Geneva Street with the regional government. This project means 85 new new units of bridge and supportive housing. Niagara is seeking a provincial partnership of capital cost. It means getting people off the streets. It means out of encampments and into safe, stable homes. Minister, will your government commit to funding the completion of 320 Geneva Street in St. Catharines? Parliamentary Assistant, Minister for Niagara, mem Member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I have to say, it's a pleasure to be able to stand here and speak about Niagara Week. We've had an amazing visit from the representatives from across the Niagara region, who had the opportunity to sit down with many of the ministers and the Premier as well. We had a great meeting with the Premier, the Minister of Transportation, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Minister of Finance, and the Minister of Infrastructure, who all spoke about the incredible amount of investments that are happening in the Niagara region. I want to give one example that refers to what the member opposite is speaking about. One of the things we heard from the delegation from Niagara was gratitude for an 86% increase in the homelessness prevention program funding. Wow. What that increase means is not it used to be $11 million a year going into the Niagara region for homelessness prevention funding to support exactly the investments in bridge housing that you're speaking about. That is now over $20 million a year, annualized funding, tens of millions of dollars going into these services to ensure that those who need it most are getting the investments. Spons. And we'll talk more about all the investments that are happening in Niagara in the supplementary. Yeah. 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 Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Back to the Minister of Housing. Um, that, that completely falls short of commitment to building affordable housing on 320 Geneva Street. Building housing without a serious commitment to affordable, non-market housing falls short. We all know this government is lagging on its affordability housing targets, risking federal funding and leaving communities in desperate need. Minister, here's an opportunity to build affordable housing served on a silver platter to you. The municipality will soon have shovels in the ground. With a provincial commitment, we can ensure the federal government comes to the table. Will you fully support the 320 Geneva Street new build project and help provide families with dignity and a place to call home in Niagara. This is a new build. This isn't what you've done. We're asking for a commitment from this government. Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, that's an 86% increase in homelessness prevention program funding that the Niagara Region is receiving, going from $11 million a year when the Liberals were in power to over $20 million. Exactly these kinds of funds are being used for bridge housing units Order. in every corner of the Niagara Region. Speaker, but it's not just when it comes to that program. It's also investments that we're seeing in health care and in education. New going up in every corner of our region. It's investments in health care by seeing not one, but two new hospitals coming to the Niagara region, the largest investment in Ontario's history. 
It's about changes to ensure that we have good jobs. And yes, Speaker, it's about earlier this week ensuring that the people of the Niagara region are going to have excellent jobs at As Asahi Kase with a $1.6 billion investment in the EV battery plant. Those are providing good jobs, that's put, not just putting food on the table for hardworking families, but ensuring that they're able to put a bit away for a rainy day. And that's the kind of investment that this Premier and this government is going, going to continue. The next question, the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is for the Minister of Long Term Care. Ontario's long term care sector is being impacted by a rapidly aging population. Speaker, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, failed to plan ahead for the needs and care of our seniors. As a result, only 611 long-term care beds were added across our province, and 40,000 Ontarians were left waiting for a place in a long-term care home. While our government has made critical investments that address the care needs for seniors across the province, there is still more that needs to be done to increase capacity in long-term care. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is Question. ensuring all Ontarians get the care and need in the long-term care home? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. So the member addresses something extremely important, which is planning for the future. Now, I think back to 2006, when the government of the day introduced something called the Ontario Growth Plan, which said they knew Ontario was going to grow at a record pace. And we also knew at the same time that we have an aging population, which means that we have a record growth within the senior sector. Now, Speaker, the last Liberal government, even though they knew about this growth, well, they failed abysmally to plan for that growth. In fact, they said they were simply hoping for the best. They made this plan to build 35,000 spaces in long-term care, and guess what? They missed the mark by 33,000. And when they left government in 2018, they had built a net new 600 and 11 beds. That's exactly why this government, after years of neglect by Bonnie Crombie's party over there, we are getting it right. We're building for seniors. That is our plan. It is simple. Let's build. And since 2018, 18,000 spaces have been built over shovels in the ground. We are working for our seniors because they work for us. We're taking care of them in Ontario, Speaker. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's great to hear that, unlike the previous Liberal government, our government continues to prioritize the needs of seniors and build more new long-term care homes. Speaker, families in my riding of Newmarket Aurora want to ensure that their loved ones will be taken care of in a long-term care home in their community. As Ontario's aging population continues to grow, it is clear that we need to build more long-term care homes across our province. By investing in long-term care infrastructure and services, our government will be able to build a stronger system that will provide care and support for Ontario seniors and their families. Speaker, once again, to the minister, what is our government doing to build more homes faster in this province? Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, the member is absolutely right. There have been some serious challenges when it comes to getting shovels in the ground. I think to the uh, Liberal carbon tax federally, which is affecting the cost of construction. I think to inflation, the supply chain challenges. But we're going to remain undeterred from getting shovels in the ground. Speaker, Willowdale, four and a half kilometres north to south, three and a half kilometres east to west. I have more spaces being built in my riding alone than the Liberals built over their entire mandate in the province of Ontario. And that's a story across every single region. I have letters here from members of the Independent Party, from members of the NDP Party, asking for more development in their neighbourhoods, because they understand something very important, that seniors took care of us and it is our turn to take care of them. That is what this government is doing. We are supported by the Ontario Long-Term Care Association, who says, I quote, no jurisdiction has made this level of continued commitment and investment in long-term care. Speaker, this Premier is showing his leadership, showing his leadership in taking care of our seniors. We're getting it done for those who took care of us in Ontario. The next question, 
The member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. We're working on a new downtown community safety plan in Ottawa to respond to a request from this government that we use funds to enhance people's safety downtown and on our transit system. We now have 120 days to respond to the government speaker, and we're meeting actively with local officials to help us come up with the best plan. My question, which is a straightforward one, which is part of our preparations, is, is the government prepared to fund in our community safety plan an un unarmed crisis response unit that could help our neighbours who are suffering with mental health and addictions? Mm -hmm. To reply, the government house leader. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member is quite correct. Uh, the Premier, uh, uh, Minister of uh, uh, finance and uh, and, uh, and infrastructure uh, did uh, undertake a, a quite historic uh, agreement with the uh, the city of Ottawa. We're working very closely with the city of Ottawa uh, to make sure that our, our priorities align. Obviously, there are priorities with respect to uh, uh, infrastructure uh, in that area and in uh, public safety. That is something that uh, uh, the premier made a focus on, Mr. Speaker. I'm meeting uh, with uh, uh, with the mayor uh, next uh, uh, next week, and uh, we will further discuss some of the priorities for the city of Ottawa. But ultimately, Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that uh, the city of Ottawa continues to grow and prosper, uh, that it continues to have uh, the best infrastructure that it possibly can. We have been told that uh, after years of neglect by the previous Liberal government, the investments in hospitals that we're making, the investments in roads that we're making, the investments that we're going to be making with respect Response. to uh, uh, public safety will all help ensuring that Ottawa is prosperous going forward. And we need the federal government to help out as well, uh, Mr. Speaker. But, uh, uh, you know, fingers crossed, uh, they're not always there for us when we need them. Uh, I want to thank the government house leader for that response, but I do would appreciate this morning, given the pressure I'm under as part of these negotiations at home, that we have a specific answer in this debate to the question, Speaker. That is, when we put forward a plan for community safety in our city to help some of our neighbours who are struggling, if anybody's been in our downtown or any of the downtown, you've seen them with mental health and addictions behaviours, we want to make sure that the best help is available to de-escalate people, to reach people and get them on a pathway to treatment. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen in Toronto is an unarmed crisis response unit of professionals is extremely successful. Mm -hmm. And what we would like to know as we prepare to respond to the government is the government prepared in our community safety plan to fund those armed professionals, to fund food security professionals. I see Rachel Wilson from the Ottawa Food Bank here in the gallery. There are many people, Speaker, who can be part of the strategy to make sure that people get fed, people find affordable housing, and people get the help they need. So the specific question, question to my friend opposite, can the unarmed crisis response unit we're getting ready be funded by the government in our proposal? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to say clearly that under the leadership of Premier Ford, public safety matters all over Ontario, including in Ottawa. And I want to give a special mention to a great chief in Ottawa Police Service, Chief Eric Stubbs. I speak to Chief Stubbs on a regular basis, and he's excited with the government's announcement of helping to work with the City of Ottawa and to put in put in extra resources that will help him combat the crime in the Byward Market District. That, that acts of criminality are deterring tourism, and that's why throughout Ontario and in Ottawa, our government will work with police services, with municipalities, to make public safety not only a focus, but a priority. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. A number of members have